small planet in a vast universe that is billions of years old. Can we look out into this vast universe and find clues that will enable us to look back into the distant past? My name is George Preston. I am a professional astronomer and am very much interested in the problem of the origin and evolution of our galaxy. I live and work on the ridge of a mountain at the Lick Observatory of the University of California. There are several large optical telescopes at this observatory, which are used to carry out a variety of related investigations in galactic astronomy. Tonight, the Crosley 36-inch telescope is being used by Conrad Sturch. The 24-inch photometric telescope by Joseph Smack. The 20-inch astrographic telescope by Thomas Kinman. I have the use of the 120-inch telescope, one of the largest optical telescopes in the world.
Beyond these stars in the Milky Way, we can see other galaxies, other systems of millions of stars, systems that appear in the telescope as hazy patches of light. Our Milky Way galaxy is very much like this galaxy. Photographs of the same galaxy taken through the telescope reveal much more detail than can be seen visually through the same instrument. This is roughly the way our own galaxy might look at a distance of a few million light years. If we wanted another view of our galaxy, it might look like this galaxy, which is seen edge on. The photograph reveals only a flattened system of stars with a central bulge. However, in our Milky Way galaxy, we know that there are many other stars that surround this flattened system, forming a sort of halo. If we could photograph the faint halo stars, the photograph might look like this illustration. The fascinating question to me is why the Milky Way galaxy assumed this shape and how it was formed originally. I am studying the motions of stars in the halo as well as the plane of the Milky Way galaxy because we can follow their present motions far back into the past and thus gain insight into the conditions under which the stars were formed. How are the motions of stars related to their historic past? Well, before I can explain, we should know something about stars in general. First, it is necessary to measure their apparent brightnesses. Let's visit Joe Smack, who is measuring the apparent brightness of stars tonight with the 24-inch telescope. A very sensitive photoelectric photometer, which converts light energy from a star into a tiny electric current, has been attached to this telescope. First, a star is identified in a finding telescope. Next, its image is isolated from the other star images in the field by means of a diaphragm. The light from this single star then passes into a photomultiplier tube, which produces a weak electrical current proportional to the light energy received. The signal is amplified and is finally displayed on a chart recorder. The farther the pen moves to the right, the greater the apparent brightness of the star. While the tracing fluctuates due to atmospheric effects, we can nevertheless get an accurate reading by averaging over suitable lengths of time. Much additional information can be obtained by measuring the star's apparent brightness in different colors. Filters, which in this case pass yellow, blue, and ultraviolet light, are inserted in the beam of starlight that passes through the telescope to the photomultiplier. From such multicolor measurements, the surface temperatures of stars can be determined as well as their apparent brightnesses. If now we know the distance to a star, and this can be measured for nearby stars by a standard surveying technique, we can calculate the real or intrinsic brightness of similar but more distant stars and incidentally, their actual sizes. Based on these measurements, we can imagine how stars might appear from a vantage point in space. We would see a great number of dim red stars with relatively low surface temperatures and that produce a thousand times less light than our own sun. We would find many stars very much like our sun with surface temperatures around 6,000 degrees. We would also find bright blue stars with surface temperatures around 50,000 degrees. These stars are thousands of times brighter than our own sun. Most of the stars in the sky can be arranged by surface temperature and intrinsic brightness into a continuous series that astronomers call the main sequence. The bright blue giants lie at one end of the sequence, the dim red dwarfs at the other. Off this main sequence, there are some immense red giants. As their colors reveal, they are cool stars. They probably began as bright blue stars, and in an evolutionary process of aging, their surfaces have cooled and they have swelled to their enormous sizes. Most of the stars in the heavens shine with a constant brightness because there is a balance between the force of gravitation that acts to contract the star and an elastic or pressure force that acts to expand it. Measurements of apparent brightness such as these have also led to the discovery of other stars, stars that are not constant in light output. In my studies of stellar motions, I make use of these variable stars. They are relatively rare and must be found by systematic search procedures. In fact, such a search is in progress tonight with the 20-inch astrograph. Tom Kinman is taking photographs of remote regions of the Milky Way to locate the variable stars in those regions. Like most telescopes, the 20-inch astrograph is mounted on a system of axles that 
permit it to be pointed in any direction above the horizon. Every location in the sky is defined by two angles, or coordinates, one parallel and the other perpendicular to the Earth's equator. They are analogous to terrestrial longitude and latitude. The telescope he is using is nothing more than a large camera. But, instead of film, astronomers work with large glass photographic plates that don't stretch or curl. The plates are coated with very sensitive emulsions, especially designed for long exposures of faint light sources. Because the exposure times are long, the complicated shutter of a conventional camera can be replaced by a window shade in front of the lens of this telescope. Kinman takes photographic plates of a selected region of the sky at intervals of a few hours, a week, a month, a year. At a later time, one of the plates taken tonight will be paired with one of the plates of the same region taken earlier. The two plates are placed in a machine that alternates views of each in rapid succession. A comparison of plates taken a few hours apart, upon careful examination, reveals the stars with rapid light variations. A comparison of plates taken months apart reveals the slow variable stars. Measurements of the brightness of a given variable star on a series of photographs gives a concise description of the way in which its brightness varies with time. Based on these measurements, we can once again imagine ourselves at some vantage point in space, where we can now compress time so that years become minutes, and months and days become seconds. In our own or another galaxy, we might observe one of the most spectacular and rare events in the sky, the explosion of a supernova. In these cataclysmic events, a star increases in brightness millions of times within a day or two, and then slowly fades away. At peak brightness, a supernova can outshine the whole galaxy of stars to which it belongs. In our own galaxy, we frequently observe milder explosions of stars called novae. While the exotic, exploding stars are mysterious and fascinating, they are unpredictable and relatively rare events in the galaxy. In other parts of the sky, we find other, less violent stars, which are also unpredictable. They are irregular variable stars that change in brightness in seemingly random fashion in a day, a month, or a year. Finally, we find stars that are predictable, that vary in brightness regularly or periodically. This star, for example, called an R.R. Lyrae star, changes its brightness regularly in periods of several hours, year after year. Despite the fact that R.R. Lyrae stars are seven times larger than our own sun, we regard them as small members of a family of regular variable stars. Searching through thousands of other stars, we find larger periodic variable stars, called Cepheids, that change in brightness regularly in periods of days. Cepheids are roughly 100 times larger than our sun. We also find the largest periodic variables in the sky, called Myras, that change in brightness regularly over periods of months. The cause of these changes in brightness is a physical pulsation, an alternate swelling and contraction in a rhythmic manner under the opposing forces of gravity and gas pressure, which are never quite in balance as in a normal star like the sun. This pulsation occurs over and over again for thousands and thousands of years. One of the most amazing properties of these regular variable stars is the beautifully simple relation between intrinsic brightness and period of pulsation. The larger, brighter stars have longer periods than the smaller, fainter stars. By means of this period luminosity law, it is possible to determine the intrinsic brightness of a pulsating star and hence its distance from a simple knowledge of its period of pulsation. The regular variable stars have attracted attention by signaling an effect, look at me, I'm special. Just determine my period of pulsation and you'll find out what kind of star I am, how bright I am, and how far away I am. I have chosen the Myra stars for my study of the galaxy because they are among the intrinsically brightest regular variables in the sky and hence can be observed at very great distances and because these distances can be determined by their period luminosity law.
Now that we can find distances to certain stars, how can we measure their motions? If we were to follow the motion of a Myra, or any star, we would find that it moves toward or away from us, in this case away from us, along our line of sight, and in addition, it moves across our line of sight. We measure the two components of motion with different instruments and with different techniques. Though Van Altena is measuring the angular motion across the line of sight of the faint members of a nearby cluster, the Hyades cluster, a family of a few thousand stars moving together through the galaxy. This cluster of stars was photographed a number of times in the 1940s with the 20-inch astrograph. Recently, the cluster was photographed again with the same telescope. The new plates are compared to the old plates on the field survey machine. A star that is a member of the cluster jumps back and forth in the same direction and by the same amount as do other members of the cluster. In the background, there are stars that don't seem to jump or have any measurable motion. They are so distant that it would take a much longer time between photographs perhaps centuries, to detect any motion they may have. Thus, motion studies across the line of sight are at present limited to relatively nearby stars, but not so for line of sight motion, which can be determined as accurately for the very distant stars as for the nearby stars, provided there is sufficient light to make the required observation. We make use of a phenomenon of physics called the Doppler effect. This is a familiar effect on sound waves due to the motion of the sound source. For example, when a train passes with its whistle blowing, the sound of the whistle changes from a high-pitched sound as the train approaches to a lower-pitched sound as the train recedes. There is a similar effect on light waves from stars, a similar shift in wavelength or color. Astronomers measure this shift by means of an optical instrument called a spectrograph. Starlight is directed to the spectrograph in the following way. The faint light from a distant star is gathered by the large 120-inch mirror and reflected toward a point of focus near the top of the telescope. For our work, the converging beam of starlight is intercepted and reflected by a second mirror back down the telescope tube. A third mirror reflects the beam through the polar axle of the telescope down to this room. The viewing telescope, which is used to identify the star and center it in the field of view, is withdrawn, and the beam of starlight crosses the room to the opening, or slit, of the spectrograph. The polished jaws of the slit reflect some of the light back to a guide viewer. Most of the light passes through the slit, and enters a room where it is reflected by a collimating mirror to a diffraction grating. This grating is an aluminized flat mirror upon which many parallel microscopic grooves have been ruled by a precision instrument. There are 15,000 grooves per inch on this grating, which disperse the light of different colors, rainbow fashion, into slightly different directions. This dispersed light is intercepted by a camera mirror and focused to produce a band of pure colors or wavelengths called a spectrum, which in this case is recorded on a photographic plate. The photographic plate has been loaded in complete darkness in a plate holder, which is placed in a camera. Again, in complete darkness, the slide is pulled, and the plate is ready to be exposed. A photograph of a small region of sky around each variable star is prepared and marked in advance of observing. If the field is crowded with stars, identification of the variable may take some time. If the star happens to be very faint on the night chosen to observe it, it may not be possible to find it at all.
Do you want the hour angle now? Yeah. One hour, 37 minutes east. One hour, 37 minutes east. Okay. Let's go to CE Jam. provides us with a set of standard spectral lines of a light source not in motion. The standard spectral lines are recorded on the same photographic plate as the spectrum of the star. The stars we are measuring are very far away, and therefore very faint. Exposure times as long as one or even two hours must be made. During this time, the atmosphere continually plays tricks with the image, changing its apparent size and deflecting it in different directions. So an astronomer spends much of his night guiding the telescope to be sure that the beam of starlight is entering the slit of the spectrograph at all times. this somewhat flattened system. 
As the motion of infall of the gas clouds continued to be arrested, the rotational motion was increased by contraction, like an ice skater who spins faster by pulling in his arms. In the context of this story, the around Myras of longer period are examples of stars formed during the later stages of the development of the galaxy. If the period of a Myra is related to its age, then, for example, by counting the numbers of Myras with various periods, we can, in principle, learn how the rate of star production in our galaxy has changed with time. In this and many other ways, we can add important detail to our story. Detail gathered from clues that nature left behind millions and billions of years ago. But history is still being made. Stars are still being born in the plane of our galaxy. Conrad Sturch is assisting George Herbig in the search for stars, or star-like objects, that have just begun to shine. A slitless spectrograph has been attached to the 36-inch Crosley telescope. This enables an observer to photograph the spectra of a number of stars in a region of the sky on one plate. In regions of dark clouds of gas and dust, objects with peculiar emission lines were located, and then carefully photographed repeatedly over periods of time. This is an early photograph, and this is a later one. On the later photograph, we can see two new objects. We can only con star formation is still going on in the Milky Way, before our very eyes. Our galaxy continues to change slowly, and in this case, we can observe the change directly. What will our galaxy be like billions of years from now? Someday, we may be able to predict the future of our galaxy as well as to describe its past. Contemporary astronomy is concerned with the origin, structure, and fate, not only of our galaxy, but of all galaxies. Astronomy is equally concerned with the origin and structure of the stars that comprise these galaxies, and of the properties of the interstellar gas and dust out of which the stars form. And many of these problems will be solved by observing tiny points and hazy patches of light, some bright, some dim, and all very far away. While there may be no final answers, while we may never know all the last details, nor all the whys, we hope to tell our children with a degree of assurance about the kind of world in which they live and to show them how exciting the study of their universe can be.